the abolishment of simony and the whole idea of buying offices. I mean, you get into periods of time within the church and you have secular rulers who become official church people and they become bishops because they buy the office. They've got the money. But why would they want to be a bishop? Well, because there's tithe revenues coming in off of those. And then they'll buy a bishopric for their son who was just newly born. Kid you not, you have a whole bishopric that's paying its tithes to an absentee bishop, kind of like absentee landlords, you know. Well, these were absentee bishops. And uh, you had young children or um, you have popes who have bastard children. He's going to take care of his boy and he gives him a bishopric. Mm -hmm. And that's guaranteed income for the rest of his life. You know? And then there were times where if you had enough money, you invested it and bought a second bishopric. Because then you skim off of two whole bishoprics and bring in twice the amount of money. <laughs> so, name it, claim it. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> then there was the beginning of total uh, ab ab uh, abolition of clerical marriages coming through Cluny. Uh, they felt like this was, they were helping reinforce the ideas coming from Gregory the First, but they are helping to bring about these kind of reforms. So it's happened over time. By 7800, you pretty well see the church taking the stand against uh, clerical marriages. And then their support of the papacy in terms of giving the power of the papacy, in, uh, the power of the church into the hands of the papacy so that the Pope rules the church, so to speak. So these are some of the reforms that come out of the monastery. Um, it, it, in many ways, the power given to the Pope mm -hmm. was to help clean up morality. As I pointed out to you, that the Clergy had sunk to different levels of terrible immorality. And we, we see this constantly within the church. Um, some of the worst people go in the ministry, not the best. And uh, that's what we've got going on here. So then Hildebrand, or Gregory VII, uh, becomes a very, is your third uh, famous pope. And here, he is probably considered the uh, the greatest of all the popes of the Middle Ages. And uh, he is building the whole idea of what we call the medieval papacy. He is an iron-fisted man, drives the church with an iron will, and is a great organizer. And so he firmly establishes the idea of this belief in uh, that the church was founded by God through Peter. So Peter is the rock, and we've already had that discussion, but he is the rock on which this church is founded. And that all princes and kings must give service to the Pope. In other words, kiss his feet. Now that's, uh, that is a position of humility. And that is a, a position of, of surrender and submission. And um, so they had taken this particular position. And that the Pope can be judged by no man. He is God's ordained. And here again, uh, he is uh, different from all other persons. And God has elevated him to this status. And he is a spiritual superior. And that while he may morally judge the, the kings and the princes, the princes can't turn around and judge the Pope. Only God can judge the Pope. Understand. Just looking at it, it seems like you know God has an elevated his people. Have That's right. People have elevated so, but They are trying to take the position that these are God ordained, mm -hmm. and that God ordained His election. As a matter of fact, you hear this whole conclave of the of the bishops, arch, uh, cardinals, and they will tell you, well, this is God ordained. Whoever is elected will be ordained by God. They accept that. I mean, in a way, we do that, too. I mean, 
Sure uh, we do. When I appeared before the Board of Orders and Relations for my, you know, eventual ordination, uh, they, they're very forthright, and I think every, and I made a big deal out of this when I was um, at the seminary, um, you, you need to know you're called. That's the only thing that's going to last when you get in a difficult situation and you wonder about, you know, whether I'll be a pastor or not. The only thing that's going to hold you is your call. And I will never forget September 9th, 1962, at 9 o'clock in the evening on the corner of North and Detroit Street in that little kid in Nazarene Church. Mm. That's where it happened. Mm. And it was as real as me looking at you today. Amen. And that's been the one thing that's helped me. Now, my mother-in-law didn't understand when I left the pastoral ministry to go into education full time. She thought I was giving up my call. I said, Stella, no. I'm not giving up my call. This is an extension of my call. I'm moving on. I'm moving on in the area of training. And then when I did get the job at the seminary three years after that move in 91, um, that was the fulfillment of that call, training pastors. And I knew that was what the Lord was directing me to. I knew it back in 1980 when I took my first teaching assignment at Mount Vernon. That was my very first, well, technically my third, but it was, I was hired to be a professor. And that was just confirmation. I knew I was going that direction. But I didn't know how or where or when, but I just knew I was going that direction. And William Youngman and David Cuby gave me that opportunity. <laughs> and I talked off and on as an adjunct five years for so I'm back. Uh, I, I think that was the whole thing. I mean, this separates you know, wheat from the chaff when it comes to pastoral ministry. Um, so that, and then here is the interesting one, this piece at the bottom here, where you're getting to this whole idea that the Roman church has never erred or ever will. <laughs> I mean, that... That's <laughs> no, not at all. That is uh, that is pure. I mean, pure arrogance, I guess you might say. But this is medieval period. This is uh, a church speaking to those who are a little educated, and this is speaking from a point of power, mm -hmm. not of weakness. And so you've got this going on, and this sets the stage then for the next, you know, 300, 250, 300 years as far as the church. Now, we're very close to the high watermark, as I told you. And I think great.